For centuries, we've been harvesting the oceans without much thought of sustainability. And today, we eat twice as much fish as we did 50 years ago. The result is that the oceans have been depleted to catastrophically unsustainable levels, with 90% of the fish stocks that we rely on being fully fished or overfished. To make matters worse, the use of agrochemicals, both in the sea and on the land, is creating dead zones, areas of high acidity and low oxygen, which are one of the biggest global threats to marine life. There are already around 500 of them worldwide, the biggest in the Gulf of Mexico, covering 23,000 square kilometers. For the seas to thrive far into the future, we need to fundamentally rethink our relationship with the oceans. And here on the coast of Connecticut, they're doing just that. Fishing has always been big business on the Long Island Sound, but in recent decades, industrial and agricultural pollutants have killed off fish stocks. I've come here to meet some of the locals tackling the problem. Hey, Russell. Hey, Bren. Yeah, Hi. great to meet you. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for coming. Bren Smith is an ocean farmer who's made it his mission to reconfigure how we harvest the sea. OK, welcome aboard. Start us up. This is great. And the good thing about ocean farming is we don't need to chase fish. So right. It's just a quick run out. Right. You used to be a fisherman, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was in the Bering Sea fishing cod and crab, mm -hmm. just at the height of industrialized fishing. And mm -hmm. most of the fish I was catching was going to McDonald's for the fish sandwich. Wow. That is like the quintessential, the epitome of the industrial fisherman. Exactly. Uh, so then, you know, I was on the Bering Sea and the cod stocks crashed in Newfoundland, back where I was from. And so I went to become a farmer on the salmon farms because that was supposed to be the answer to overfishing, mm. but it was just as bad, right? You know, using pesticides, antibiotics, polluting. Um, you know, I, we were essentially running pig farms at sea. So I ended up uh, down here and ma remade myself as a, you know, what we're calling a 3D ocean farmer. What is, the, what is a 3D ocean farm? Sure. What do you mean by that? Imagine an underwater garden, right, where uh, you're using the entire water column, which means we have very small the footprints. Verticality. Vertical, yeah. right? Mm. The entire farm is cultivated off a system of lines and buoys, which act like scaffolding. Kelp grows from the horizontal lines closest to the surface, then vertically downwards, there are mussels, and then below that, oysters and clams on the ocean floor. All right, let's go. Bren has a 20-acre farm which produces 53,000 kilos of kelp every year, along with 200,000 kilos of shellfish. Today, I'm going to help check the lines. Here's the Green Wave team. Jill's going to come aboard and uh, learn how to do some kelp farming. Ahoy! Ahoy! <laughs> All right, you ready to see some kelp? Yeah. All right. There's the vegetable of the sea right there. Let's attach some muscle socks, okay? Yeah, sounds good. All right, good. And then we're just going to go not. around the knot. <laughs> Unlike conventional aquaculture, Bren's ocean farming has no need for agrochemicals. In fact, it even seems to clean the water of pollution, and it sequesters carbon, thereby helping to tackle climate change. Is there a reason why you, you've chosen mussels? So they're really lean proteins, packed full of omega-3s, but also soak up nitrogen. They filter, they use nitrogen to grow. Uh, filter it out of the water column. And, uh, you know, this farm filters millions of gallons of water a week. An oyster filters up to 50 gallons a day. Really? Just one oyster. Wow. Right? You, if, you, if you were to um, take a network of these farms, totaling 5% of U.S. waters, um, you, you could remove the equivalent carbon output of over a million cars. What the kelp does is it reduces the acidification rate. It pulls so much carbon and nitrogen out that it changes the water quality. So we've done studies, and it's called the halo effect of the kelp actually working together with the oysters. Wow, that companion companion species. Exactly, exactly. Wow. You know, they're meant to be together. Wow. Oh, it's quite romantic. <laughs> Bren's claims are certainly intriguing, but can this system really help clear up dead zones and revitalize the seas? At the Seaweed Marine Biotechnology Lab at the University of Connecticut, Stanford, they've been studying just this question. 
This is proper science. Yes. What's going on in here? So we have a lot of the kelp microscopic stages growing right here. Dr. Simona Orgeit is leading the research. In some coastal estuaries like Long Island Sound, we have a lot of nutrient runoff, so from fertilizers or from wastewater treatment plants. A lot of those nutrients get concentrated into the water and then they can cause problems like um, harmful algal blooms or you know hypoxic conditions. And so mm. by growing seaweed, as, uh, uh, in addition to shellfish, we can uptake some of those nutrients and mm. help clean up the waters. Basically. And the hypoxic, that's like low oxygen. Is that right. right, yes, exactly. Which is not good, right. like for, 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 for fish, for... exactly. Simona is going to show me how they use kelp to both monitor and clean the waters in the sound. Okay, so the what's first the plan? thing we're going to do is we're going to take some of this harvested kelp uh, that we pulled off the long lines and we're going to grind it up in the in this little machine. All right. Once pulverized, Simona can calculate the level of nitrogen in the kelp, which in turn helps her learn how much needs to be grown to clean the waters of pollutants. Based on that, then we can say, you know, based on that percentage, if we grow this much seaweed on this long of a line, then we're taking up that much nitrogen from the water. Information like this is vital for Bren, who uses it to determine how much kelp he has to cultivate in order to improve the water in his patch of the sound. 3D farming proposes a close collaboration between fishermen and scientists, but that's not all. Yet another important partnership is happening on dry land. Toby Fisher is a farmer who recently started working with Bren. He used to use conventional fertilizer until six months ago when he switched to kelp. So this is where we're processing the kelp turned into fertilizer. Yeah, it yeah. has a nice, a nice smell to it. Wow, that's how yeah, you yeah. know it's that's how you know it's the good stuff. So what is actually going on here? Like why why do you not just put it straight on the fields? The nutrients from the kelp will will transfer over to the water. Because you see the kelp just turns just into like, in a, it's pretty, yeah. like a like oh, a wow, yeah. goo. Yeah, right. And so all the nutrients leaches out into the liquid and then we can use the liquid to fertilize. I'm not going to get, like, some crab jump out. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Toby's farm grows over 25 different kinds of fruit and veg, supplying the local community. And it's this organic, plant-based fertilizer that he now uses on all his crops. This is kale. Can I yeah. try a little bit? Yeah. It's so going to this... ruin kale for you, though, because you'll never taste kale and taste that good again. <laughs> Do you feel a kind of connection to the sea because of this operation? Most land-based farmers don't think about their actions and how they affect the sea. The nutrients run off from the land, they go out into the ocean, the kelp uses it to grow, and then it comes back here. Right. So it really closes the sea, sea to land mm. loop. Closing this land to sea loop is a huge part of 3D farming's appeal. But in the center of New Haven, there's another collaboration which is putting sustainability on the menu. I'm off to meet Avi Shapiro, head chef at Roya, to find out more. Brand came to me with the kelp, and he's like, here it is, use it. Once he started telling me the story, once we started dialoguing on the benefit, more than anything sustainability perspective, I started playing around with it. I started using it in a variety of different ways that I can feel like, man, this has legs. So, Should I just go ahead and... Yeah, go ahead and, and as you would regular pasta. It smells fantastic. All right, here it goes. It's good. It is good. Yeah, it is good. We're going to actually see this kind of ocean farming have a significant impact on ocean cleanup, on climate change. You need but we to need eat to enough. Eat, we need to eat loads of this stuff. We, we need, need to, to get everybody eat eating it. You got to seduce the customer. If I seduce the customer to a way that people start asking for it, then let Brent figure out how to mass produce it. That's not my, that's not my role. department, yeah. My goal is if they like it, I've done my bit. 
A change is afoot here in New Haven, and 3D farming is at the heart of it all. I mean, we've got to tell a story, and a hopeful story about the future, right? You know, it's all bad news about climate change and food insecurity, stuff like that. But I think out here we can say, hey, our oceans are a blank slate, and this is our chance to really build something new and build something from the bottom up that is sustainable, restorative, and doesn't make all the mistakes of industrial agriculture and industrial aquaculture.